Hola, estudiantes. Did I say that right, Maria Khan? You'll have to catch me later. All right. Today we're going to talk about context clues. It's our next standard in our list of standards. We've already done synonyms and antonyms. You did great with that. We already did affixes and roots. I had a little trouble with that, but that's okay. That's something we're going to do all year long and help you to get better at. And today we're going to do context clues. So we've learned these great words. We learned that there are synonyms of words and antonyms of words. We learned that if you add stuff to the beginning and add stuff to the end and you have a root in the middle, then you have this amazing word. But what happens when all of those skills that you have just don't work because you truly do not recognize the word? You can't remember what one of those prefixes mean or those pesky suffixes are confusing you. Well, what do we do? That's when we turn to our context clues. So everything is readable. I don't want you to be intimidated by reading anymore. Everything that we're doing in this class is helping you to become a better reader. So don't be intimidated. Once we can figure out the little parts of what we're reading called words, you're gonna be a much better reader in the long run. So again, today we're gonna talk about context clues, so let's go ahead and get started with that. Context clues, put down the dictionary, why? Smitty has sips and tricks. Context clues are words that say, stop, don't touch that dictionary. The definition of the word you don't know is right here in the text, and you're going to be amazed at how often that happens. Learning how to use these clues will help us to understand the meaning of the word, to understand the reading, and to improve our vocabulary. And I know what you're all doing right now. You're this guy. I don't know about this. Well, let's look at some types of context clues, and maybe this will seem a little bit more familiar to you, or at least doable. So what we have are definition or description, restatement or synonym, contrast or antonym, comparison example, list or series, cause and effect, description or inference. Now, each of these is a type of context clue that a lot of writers will include for you to help to make their writing clearer. So let's take a look first at definition and description up in the top right corner here. The unknown word is explained by using a more familiar word or phrase. That seems easy enough. So we're going to look right to the text for this. So if we see something that says the dudeen, a short stemmed clay pipe, is found in Irish folktales. Well, you know that the dudeen, you didn't know when you saw it, you said, what is a dudeen? I don't even know what that is. But then you read more and you said, oh, it's a short stemmed clay pipe. That's how you find your answer. It's right there. So don't just skip words that you don't know or look unfamiliar, intimidating. Read the rest of the sentence. There might be a definition or description. The next one, his emaciation, that is his skeleton-like appearance, was frightening to see. So there's that signal right there. That is his signal, his skeleton-like appearance. So emaciation, we do have a root in there. We do have a suffix in there. But if that didn't help you with that word, you would just read further and say, that is his skeleton-like appearance. Oh, so the emaciation must mean that he looks like a skeleton, so he's probably famished. Remember that word? We learned that word on Monday. So that's definition and description. Nothing to be afraid of. Next, we have restatement or synonym in the bottom right, in the bottom left corner. The meaning is usually right after the unfamiliar word and often separated from the rest of the sentence with commas, dashes, or parentheses. The word sometimes, or that is, or in other words, is used. So let's take a look. Meat eaters, that is carnivores, are at the top of the food chain. That's very similar to the emaciation example. No big thing. So we don't know what meat eaters are, or carnivores rather. We look backwards in this sentence instead of forwards, and it says meat eaters, that is carnivores, are at the top of the food chain. So what are carnivores? Meat eaters. The mountain pass was a torturous road, winding and twisting like a snake around the trees of the mountainside. Well, if you didn't know what tortuous meant, if a road is winding and twisting like a snake, you can kind of assume that it was probably dangerous. You also see something familiar in there. Tort, torture, tortuous, terrifying, scary. Remember? Good. Let's move forward. Contrast or antonym, this is similar to a synonym, but again, the opposite. The unfamiliar word is shown to be different from or unlike another word and is often an opposite. So you're going to see words like but, however, although, otherwise, unless, instead, on the contrary, on the other hand, while, never, no, or not. These may be used to signal contrast. Let's look at our two examples. 
Mike's parrot was loquacious. Smitty is a little loquacious, but Maria's barely spoke at all. So if Mike's parrot was loquacious, but Maria's barely spoke at all, they're putting them at opposite ends of the spectrum. So if Maria's parrot is barely spe speaking at all, and it's not like it's the opposite of Mike's parrot, then Mike's parrot must speak a lot. Loquacious, Smitty. Next one, he was a lively conversationalist, but she was reserved and taciturn. So if he was a lively conversationalist, and on the opposite, we had the girl who was reserved and taciturn. Well, if you're a lively conversationist, then you're probably loquacious, right? And taciturn must mean the opposite then, probably reserved and not very talkative at all. Let's take a look at comparison over here in the bottom left corner. The unfamiliar word is shown to be the same or um, like another word. So the word, you would see signal words like to, like, as, similar to, or in the same way may be used to signal comparison. Let's take a look at our examples. My brother is enthralled by birds, similar to the way that I'm fascinated by insects. So if, he, if his being enthralled is similar to her being fascinated, enthralled must mean something like fascinated. See how that works? And our second one, when I'm being obstinate, my mom says I get that from my stubborn father. Oh, well, if he gets the trait from his stubborn father and they made it a point to say his father was stubborn, what must obstinate mean? You got it, stubborn. Let's take a look at our next one. We have example. The unfamiliar word is cleared up by giving an example. And so you're going to see signal words such as, for instance, such as, and for example. Let's take a look at our example. In the course of a man's evolution, certain organs have atrophied. We have some great root. We have a root, a suffix, and a prefix in that word. So if you're feeling up to the challenge, look it up. The appendix, for example, has wasted away from disuse. So if they use the appendix, for example, which has wasted away from disuse, what must atrophied mean? Wasted away. Let's look at list or series. The unfamiliar word is included in a series of related words that give an idea of the word's meaning. What? Let's take a look at our example. North American predators include grizzly bears, pumas, wolves, and foxes. Oh, so what do they all have in common? Predators, and there's another root word in there. And we, can, we know that those have something in common. And if we can figure out what they all have in common and why they would all be included in the same list, we can figure out what predators are. So we have cause and effect. The meaning of an unfamiliar word is signaled by a cause and effect relationship between ideas in the text. So let's take a look. This one takes a little practice. Our example. Due to a dearth of termites, the aardvark starved to death. Aardvarks eat termites, so I have to think. So if the aardvark starved to death, it didn't have enough food, and it usually it's termites, so a dearth of termites starved the aardvark. Oh, so there must mean like the extermination of termites or something, right? Makes sense. Next we have, she wanted to astound all her dinner guests with the food she served, so she carefully studied the necessary culinary arts. Well, why would she carefully study the necessary culinary arts? because she wanted to astound her dinner guests. So she wanted to do something good for her dinner guests. She wanted to amaze them. So she carefully studied the culinary arts. Cause and effect. Description or inference. The meaning of an unfamiliar word can be inferred from the description of a situation or experience. Description or inference. Let's take a look at our examples. The monkey's vociferous, vociferous chatter made me wish I had earplugs. Why would you want earplugs? Well, you would want them if vociferous chatter meant that he wouldn't shut up. So vociferous, we can probably assume, means talking a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, or something similar to that. Next, we have she told her friend, I'm through with blind dates forever. What a dull evening. I was bored every minute. The conversation was absolutely vapid. If she was bored every minute and, and the evening was dull, she probably meant that the conversation was dull or boring or awful or just non-existent. So we can assume that vapid means something along those lines. So let's take a look, very quick look at word structure called etymology, the study of word structure. If you know the meaning of part of a word, you might be able to guess the meaning of the entire word. And this is what we did with, prefixes, with suffixes, prefixes, and root words. The story is incredible. The prefix in means not, the root cred means to believe, and the suffix able means able to. 
Therefore, if a story is incredible, it is not believable. The somnambulist, there's a cool word for you, had to be locked in his bedroom at night for his own safety. If a reader knows the meaning of the root ambular, which means to walk, and the roots som, S-O-M-N, which means sleep, and the suffix ist, a person involved in the activity, then the reader may realize that a somnambulist is a sleepwalker. And there you have it. That is context clues, everybody. Ain't no thing. You got this. I'll see you in class.